Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. But let's talk a little bit about epigenetic clocks because they sure are getting a lot of attention. Um, you want to maybe tell folks what they are specifically, um, how they work, and what they're aspiring to do? Sure. So uh, just take a step back. I mean, I think, you know, the word epigenetics actually means a lot, right? I mean, it can, can mean any, anything that is inherited that's not at the level of your DNA sequence. But, but mostly when people talk about epigenetic clocks, which they're, what they're specifically talking about are chemical modifications either to the DNA or to the histones that pack the DNA. And these chemical modifications control gene expression, so things like methylation and acetylation. Um, and so what has been observed um, in laboratory animals and in humans is that there are changes in these epigenetic marks that happen in a predictable way with age. And there are tens of thousands of these marks that can be measured you know, at any given time um, in a cell. And that you can create algorithms that are that, that predict the age-related changes in these epigenetic marks with a pretty high degree of accuracy. So you can, you can sample a subset of these specific chemical changes um, and come up with an algorithm that within you know, plus or minus five years will predict a person or an animal's chronological age. And that works really well. And that seems to work really well in every organism where, where people have looked. All the way from very early development up into old age, you can, you can create these, these, uh, these predictive algorithms. And so what the, the idea that has emerged from that is that you can do that at the population level. And then if you identify individuals whose chronological age doesn't match up really perfectly well with their epigenetic age, in other words, they lie off of that best fit line, that those people may be biologically younger or older than their chronological age. And so that's where this idea of these epigenetic clocks has come from, is you then, at least in principle, can predict a person's biological age depending on how well they fit the best fit line for this, this algorithm. And I think that the evidence in support of that um, comes mostly from, from longitudinal studies in humans where you can, you can create a training set and a test set and you know what the future outcomes were for some of these people. They've been sampled, you know, let's say over 20 years. And indeed, you can see a, a relationship between the people whose predicted biological epigenetic age uh, say is younger than their chronological age. And then when, they, when you look at them 20 years later, they have a lower likelihood of developing specific diseases or potentially of dying. So I think that's, that's, that's the case that can be made for these epigenetic clocks, that they are telling you something about future, um, future risk. I think in my view, the limitation to these epigenetic clocks, there's several. Uh, one is that there are about two dozen of them. And, and honestly, I can't tell from the way people argue with each other, which are the best and which aren't. Um, but I think more what concerns me is nobody has ever done what I would view as the definitive experiment, which is to actually show in the same individual or in the same population that you can, you can actually predict future health outcomes. Now, some people will argue that the longitudinal data you know, makes that not, not necessary. I think there are a couple of reasons why, why I don't agree with that. One big one is that the environment that we live in as humans has changed dramatically over the last three decades. And we know that environment plays a huge role in epigenetic modifications. And so the epigenetic marks that, are, that were most relevant for health outcomes 30 years ago might not be the most relevant today. So that's, that's one. The other is this is actually a pretty easy experiment to do in mice. And it really bothers me that nobody has done it. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you that, Matt. So how many times is someone doing a mouse study that is going to the end of life? I mean. Like All as we time. sit here speaking, yeah. right? Like, so, so why do we not have the definitive lifespan study for each of these epigenetic clocks? I think that's a legitimate question. I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, people will tell you that, you know, the clocks aren't as good in mice and I, look, it should be doable. And honestly, it should have been done three, four years ago. So, so I think that's a, it's a, you know, it's a black hole in the literature that, that hasn't been filled yet. And, and just to be explicit, I mean, I think the experiment you want to do, right, is you take a cohort of mice at, say, 20 months, you measure their epigenetic age in blood, you do a few interventions, 
that we know should extend lifespan, right? You measure their epigenetic age in blood six months later, you do it six months later, and then you see at an individual and population level what the, what the survival is, and you can do end-of-life pathology. And so if the clocks are working, you should absolutely be able to detect that signature well in advance of end of life, right? And I think that would, you know, if somebody did that experiment and it worked, I would be convinced. That would that would make me really be a believer, you know, in, in the epigenetic clocks, um, particularly if you could do it at the individual level, but it hasn't been done yet. So, you know, so I think it's it's a little bit unclear. That's a big ask to do it at the individual level. I think it is one thing to do it at the population level, but you know, the question is how will it, how will it port to the individual level? The, the other thing that's, we, we use this term and you've already alluded to this, we use this term kind of broadly, but sometimes when a person says epigenetic clock, they mean literally a set of biomarkers that look at methylation patterns on DNA. Yeah. And other times when people say epigenetic clock, they mean an algorithm that looks at 15 biomarkers that can include obviously the methylation pattern on DNA, but can include things like vitamin D level, yeah. fasting glucose level, you know, sort of traditional biomarkers. Um, do you have a point of view on the difference between these? Well, I think what you just said is accurate, right? They're different. Um, they're measuring different things. I, you know, my personal um, intuition is that the clocks, so I would call that more of a general aging clock, a putative aging clock, I guess I should say, that, that, that the, the putative aging clocks that incorporate things beyond epigenetics are much more likely to actually work in a useful way in humans. And I think one reason to believe that is, is if you look at what people call the hallmarks of aging, right? These sort of famous nine things, molecular conserved um, processes that, that seem to contribute to aging, only one of them is, is epigenetics. And so I think you run the risk with the epigenetic clocks that you're only informing on a subset of the biological aging processes. And if you look more broadly, you're much more likely to get a holistic picture at the whole individual level. I wanna come back to something you said though. You said it's kind of a, it's kind of a heavy lift or, or, or a hard ask to, to, to get these clocks to work at the individual level. That may be true, but I think in order for them to be useful, <laughs> that's what you want, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. To be and and that's exactly right. The the fact that it is so hard to be that, that would it be so hard to do speaks to exactly why you would love to see it done. Yeah. I still come back to what we talked about earlier. I, I think I find it hard to believe. I hope I'm wrong because this would be a really efficient way to do things. But I just have a hard time believing that there's going to be. Um, an epigenetic signature that I think will be more valuable than some of the most tried and true phenotypic tests. You know, VO2 max, zone two threshold, grip strength, muscle mass, you know, fat-free mass index, all of these sorts of things that are so highly, and I believe causally linked to longevity um, so I guess if nothing else, it will be interesting to see how tight that association can be. So I, I would agree with you about the, the epigenetic marks, like methylation specifically. I, I'm a little bit more optimistic that you can create the kind of more, more broad uh, aging clock or aging signature. But do you think it can be done out of an existing collection of biomarkers? Or do you think we're going to have to go deeper into the proteome and metabolome yeah. to find things we don't even know exist yet. In other words, find th find other molecules that we basically haven't identified yet. I don't know. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I, it wouldn't surprise me if, just given the state of knowledge today, that there are a subset of you know the 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 things that people in the field are thinking about that can actually be e extremely predictive at the individual level. It's never gonna be perfect, you can always do better, but all of the things you mentioned, all of the functional outcomes that, that, that we know are important for health, there is underlying biology that drives that. And I think we've got, you know, certainly an incomplete, but a pretty good idea of what a lot of the processes are that are driving that, that loss of function and that degeneration. So, so I don't know, we'll, time will tell, but, but I feel like, you know, the, the candidates we've got are pretty good and, and they may not be as precise as you can get if you can do a full functional workup on a person, but they might be good enough to tell you some, some, some information about likely efficacy of lifestyle changes or drug interventions or things that people might wanna incorporate to potentially maximize their health span. <laughs>